Um, today we're joined by Dr. Liz Thomas from the British Antarctic Survey. Um, and I'll, I'll give Liz's bio in a second. Firstly, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is a reminder to anyone that's interested in joining the Paleo Climate Society Committee. We have lots of committee positions up at the moment. Um, you can check our Twitter or the website. Um, I think you may have had an email as well. Um, we're really, really keen to have lots of applications from different people in different career stages, in particular for committee positions. So if you have any questions, uh, myself or Sophie or Amy or Carrie or anyone currently on the committee would be happy to, to answer those questions and talk about what's involved. Um, and of course, a reminder that these seminars happen on the first Wednesday of every month. So we've got some really nice speakers lined up this year. Um, so please do continue coming uh, month after month. So Dr. Liz Thomas is a paleoclimatologist and head of, ice core of the ice core research group at the British Antarctic Survey. She uses stable water isotopes and geochemistry from ice cores to reconstruct past climate, surface mass balance and sea ice variability in the polar regions over centennial to millennial timescales. She is chair of the Pages Working Group climate variability in Antarctica and the Southern Hemisphere over the past 2000 years, and leads theme one of the instabilities and thresholds in Antarctica, instant scientific research program. Liz has led several expeditions to Antarctica, the Arctic, Greenland and Svalbard, and recently an expedition to drill the first ever ice cores from the subantarctic islands. So thank you again for joining us, Liz. Um, I'll hand over to you in a second. First, to quickly say, if you have any questions that arise while Liz is, is giving her talk, you're welcome to drop them into the Q&A box uh, or into the chat. Um, and myself and Sophie will, will ask for questions at the end of the talk. Um, the talk will be recorded, but none of the participants' information or names will be included in that recording. Um, so you'll be able to watch back on YouTube at a later date. So I think that's all the housekeeping. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Liz. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, share my screen. There we go. So we did check it earlier, but just another thumbs up that I am sharing the right screen. Good. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> thank you. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation to come and give this um, seminar. Um, it's um, I'm going to give an, an overview of some research and although I'm giving it myself, I'm actually giving it on behalf of a whole range of different collaborators um, and members of the, the ice core group. So, um, yeah, this isn't just my work. I'm presenting lots of different research. Let's check it. It's moving a bit slowly. There we go. So. I decided actually, because I was asked to give this talk and people are probably expecting an ice course talk, that I'm actually going to start at the, at the end. So I'm going to present what's arguably the most iconic ice core record and one that presumably most people are familiar with and are probably expecting to see. So this is the Epicodome Sea ice core, the 800,000 year record that captured um, these eight glacial cycles where the Earth has, uh, sorry, well, at least Antarctica has shifted from these very warm um, interstadial conditions and um, through to the very cold stadial conditions. Um, and as some of you are probably aware, um, the international ice core community are actually currently um, working towards drilling the next deep ice core with high hopes of extending this re record beyond the past million years. Um, but for now, this is our oldest record and arguably one of the most significant. The Dome Sea record, some of the reasons why it's so important and iconic is because it really did provide um, some really essential information and evidence about the role of greenhouse gases in our um, climate system. So particularly demonstrating as shown here, the carbon dioxide record from the ice cores overlaid on top of the, the temperature reconstruction here to show how um, these changes in temperature have, have tracked the changes in um, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And so this is something really for um, that's been a very powerful tool, particularly when talking about um, climate change and, and for policymakers, because it really is quite hard to deny that the levels of um, CO2 in the atmosphere today are outside of the range of natural variability. So although these records really have considerably advanced our understanding about the Earth's climate and are undoubtedly very important, much of my own research is actually 
um, focus much more towards recent timescales and much more looking on, on human timescales and this tiny little blip of the Earth history. But this is where I actually feel like we've made, you know, as, as, a, as humankind, have made the most impact. So just a bit of background, everyone should be very much familiar with this, but on a global scale, clearly the 20th century has been this period of very rapid climate change. And so some of these plots here, just from the most recent two IPCC reports, demonstrating that we've got this steady increase in temperature since um, 1900. And then obviously looking towards the future, we've got these predictions of this continued and accelerated warming through the 21st century and beyond. And in Antarctica, sorry, I'm just pausing because there's a slight delay in my, my screen from chain out again. Right. Okay, we're on it. So it's not going to object again. So very sorry about that. Um, so yes, yeah, so I was trying to give you a bit of background to the sort of recent changes and really kind of understanding why it is that I'm so focused, particularly on this recent time period. And so demonstrating here what's well known is that Antarctica has been losing mass and it's been contributing to sea levels. But it's also important to remember and sort of consider Antarctica not as an isolated landmass, but actually as part of the, the, the wider southern hemisphere changes. So both the mass loss and the atmospheric warming that we've seen have been, uh, you know, we have to consider this as a combination of both atmospheric and oceanic changes. So notably, we've got the strengthening of the westerly winds, uh, these circumpolar westerly winds, and also we've got changes in sea surface temperatures. So this is both in observed as mid-latitude warming sea surface temperatures, but also higher latitude cooling trends since the 1980s. And then on top of that, we have the associated changes in sea ice. But it's just also important to note that a lot of these observed changes, and we've got a huge amount of information, but actually from a very recent time period, so a very short snap um, like time period from the 1970s onwards when the satellite era really began. So this was to give you a bit of a backdrop to my research. So I am a paleoclimatologist and I do study the past climate and I look at um, climate change over a range of different timescales. But it's really with an aim of understanding the present climate change. So what I want to do, and that's sort of my aspiration, if you like, is to produce data that's going to help to inform us and ideally maybe help constrain the future climate predictions. So this is why I focus very much on these shorter timescales for this. And so when I was asked about doing this seminar, I thought about different studies that I could present. Um, but actually, I decided to use this as a bit of an opportunity to share what I'm calling my ice core toolbox. Um, so this is rather than um, providing any, any single study in any detail, I'm just going to give some insight into the different ways in which ice cores can help us to understand these key components in the climate system with ultimately looking for um, how they can help us understand the present and hopefully the future climate change. So I'm going to present five case studies um, of research from my, my own research and part of my team's research. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is snow accumulation, and this is something I've been working on for quite a while, but I'm actually going to take you right back to basics, so please don't be insulted by the, the very um, basic schematics here. But it's really, you know, what essentially is an ice core and what's it telling us? So ice cores are just made up of compacted snowfall. So really what they're doing is they're capturing the moisture transport. And so as we get moisture that evaporates off the surface of the ocean, it's deposited on the ice, and that's what, what turns into our ice core. And the amount of snow that's deposited is dependent on a number of different factors. So some of them include the warming, so warming sea surface temperatures resulting in increased evaporation and hence more snowfall, but also other factors such as the reduction or changes in the sea ice, either as a result of um, warming sea surface temperatures or the more dynamical wind-driven changes in sea ice. And what happens when you remove the sea ice is that you actually take away this lid on the surface ocean and you make um, you increase the availability of the surface level moisture and hence you end up with more snowfall on the ice sheet. And the snowfall in an ice core um, is termed the snow accumulation because this is the combination or the net result of the precipitation, but also taking into account some of the losses, which include the, the sublimation, wind erosion, and also in some, some areas melt. And the way that we um, measure snow accumulation in an ice core is we take advantage of the seasonal deposition of a range of different chemical species. So I'm just showing one little example on the plot here um, where we've got hydrogen peroxide and non-sea salt sulfates. And these are two very seasonal um, indicators. So hydrogen peroxide is a fantastically useful tool at some locations, 
um, because it can, it's a photochemical species, which means that it peaks during the summer solstice in Antarctica when we've got 24 hours of daylight. And then we've got these, these really clear troughs during the polar night when we have um, no um, solar activity. And so when we're looking, these are how we can actually annual layer count the ice core. But for, in terms of looking at the snow accumulation, it's the distance between these peaks which we're interested in. So how much snow fell in an individual year is determined by the distance of these peaks. What we can then do is we can correct this um, layer thickness um, for ice thinning and take into account the flow and the density, and this produces your snow accumulation record. We can then plot this layer thickness or the snow accumulation through time to observe the trends. And so in the case here, I'm plotting three ice cores from um, the Antarctic Peninsula, the first of which was the Gomez ice core, um, which I drilled back in 2006. And this was the first time really that we were able to show that there was um, a big increase in snowfall. And in fact, there was a doubling of snowfall since 1850. So when I first published this, this was met with, um, it's fair to say, a little bit of skepticism um, because it was argued that it could have possibly been just um, what was happening at a single site. But since then, we've been building up the picture by drilling more and more ice cores to actually show that this is a really quite consistent pattern that we're seeing across the whole of the Antarctic Peninsula region. And actually at several other low elevation coastal sites as well, we've got this big increase in snowfall during the 20th century. But it's only really when you start looking at this on the continental scale that you start to realize just how significant this is. And so back in 2017, so, um, I published a, a, all of the available records at that time, which was 79 ice core records of snow accumulation. And what this was able to do was to demonstrate that on a continental scale, there's been an, an actually really significant increase in snowfall, particularly during the latter part of the 20th century. So on the slide here, I'm presenting in two different ways. The, the trends in total Antarctic snowfall, and this is in gigatons per year since 1800. So on the left, we've got a histogram, and this is showing the, um, both the 50 and the 100 year trends. And the, the vertical lines are indicating the location of the most recent of those trends to really sort of demonstrate that the most recent 50 and 100 year trends in this record are outside what we would consider the natural variability or the expected range. And then another way of showing this is, is spatially. And so what we've done here, you could just sort of faintly see probably all the little yellow crosses are indicating where the actual ice core sites are here. And what we've done is match this record onto the spatial grid of the atmospheric models. And so this allows us to look at not just the, the total increases, but more of the spatial variability to really understand the different um, patterns and trends that are occurring during this time. But when you combine all of this together and look at the ice sheet as a whole, we can see that actually the surface mass balance or snow accumulation has dramatically increased since 1800. And that's actually in the order of 272 billion tonnes more snowfall annually um, fell during the most recent decade. And in, in this um, particular study, the most recent decade was up until uh, 2010, compared with what the, the um, decadal uh, snowfall was in the beginning of the 18th century. So this is, um, you know, the equivalent actually, and we, and we work this out, it's the equivalent of twice the volume of the Dead Sea, so huge, huge volumes of snowfall. And so during the 20th century, this actual additional snowfall that fell over Antarctica, where it was then trapped under the ice sheet, was enough to mitigate global mean sea levels by 10 millimetres. So I hope this is kind of clear why understanding what's driving and, and actually knowing about what's happening with the surface mass balance and the snow accumulation is actually of global significance. However, there's still quite a lot of unknowns, and particularly we're interested in, well, what's driving these changes? Um, you know, why is this big increase in snowfall occurring? But I just also think it's quite important to put this into some context, because although I'm saying that changes in snowfall are really important, it's important to remember that Antarctic, we talk about Antarctic mass balance, because it's worth knowing that what's coming out through the melt and the mass loss, which is obviously well known and well publicized, we also need to know what's going in through the snowfall. But at the moment, the two things are still quite out of balance. So even though I've been able to demonstrate that during this recent period, so just looking at the, the, the recent um, period from 92 to 2017, we've got this big increase in snowfall in the order of about 72 gigatons per year. But actually, this is on a backdrop of, of Antarctic mass loss. Um, and from the most recent studies from 2018, we're showing that we're losing mass in the order of 219 gigatons a year. So clearly we're not, we're not in balance, but we are still making a significant, um, it is still a significant component of the mass balance equation. 
So the next thing I'm going to touch on is surface temperatures. And I'm going to put this slide up, but I'm imagining that most people are fairly familiar with the use of stable water isotopes in different paleoclimate archives. And for ice cores, we certainly take advantage of the fact that at the high latitudes, the ratio of the heavy and light oxygen is related to temperature. However, I'm not really going to touch on this very much. I just wanted to use this um, and, and move on to demonstrate that actually there are other proxies out there for um, past surface temperature, and one of them being the snow accumulation itself. So some of the work that we did from the compilation of um, Antarctic snowfall is actually used this in a number of different ways, and one of which was the data model into comparison. So in collaboration with some uh, colleagues of mine, Saud Goose and Quentin Daladin, um, we actually did a range of different um, model data into comparisons. And what Quentin was able to do, or Quentin was able to do, was establish that actually there is a significant relationship between the snow accumulation and surface temperature across a range of different, um, the outputs from a range of different global circulation models. So he is, Quentin used this data assimilation approach where he actually combines the spatial, uh, spatially limited ice core data um, with the physical and the physics of the global circulation model. And so this means that we can actually then produce a much more spatially complete record um, that can actually take us back further in time. And then the study that we were doing was demonstrating that um, snow accumulation is strongly correlated to the temperature. But in fact, the temperature reconstructions that, that Quantum produced from this were actually even more strongly correlated with um, and had a higher, higher correlation with surface temperatures than the more traditional um, proxies, including stable water isotopes. But actually, ultimately, the best method to use is using the two of them together. So the next thing I'm going to move on to is talking about all the other information that um, ice cores can provide. So I'm hoping this video is going to work. So hopefully this is showing up on your screen. I love looking at these, um, these images. So this um, is from produced by NASA. And it's just really important to remember that everything in an ice core actually came from somewhere else. So the chemical impurities that the ice contains have been transported um, quite significant distances. And it's often easy to consider Antarctica as a sort of isolated landmass. But what we're seeing here is that it's actually very well connected with everything that's happening across the rest of the planet. So the dust here appears in these shades of orange, and we've got the sea salts and these shades of blue. I should say, if it wasn't obvious enough, this is false color. Um, but then we've got these sort of sulfates that are changing in these whites and carbon. We've got changes that are appearing in green. And some of these have very distant source region, regions, but this sort of constant circulation patterns and even these tropical teleconnections mean that the ice is there. These are being transported even as very small particles to Antarctica. So therefore, an ice core is made up of all of this different information. And the concentration of the particles and the chemistry in the ice core are capturing really important information about land use changes, including so, um, changes in the agriculture, changes in the land use, um, but also changes and in the influence of industry. And so sadly, there is growing evidence of um, pollution that's reaching Antarctica. And just as a little side note, I've been working with a team from UCL um, who've actually been able to identify what we believe is the first evidence of fly ash particles in an Antarctic ice core. And these um, come from the, these fly ash or come from the high combustion of fossil fuels. So they've been tra transported quite large distances. But ice cores also capture natural variability too. So these blue um, plumes on the, on the figure here are representing the marine air aerosols and the transport of sea salts from the open ocean to the ice sheets. Some of the other things that we're able to capture here are actually the volcanic emissions. I'm just going to do a little um, note here to, to how actually volcanoes are used and important within ice core research. So I've got two little studies here and the image just in the middle is an example from um, of a, an ash layer from the waste divide ice core. But quite often what we see in ice cores uh, from the volcanic influence at least is not in the visible, it's actually in the chemical or in the, the very small particle sizes. But what we've got on the left is actually a tephra shard, and this was identified across a number of different West Antarctic ice cores. And interestingly, it's been used to verify a previously unconfirmed volcanic eruption from one of the sub-Antarctic islands. So I just think this is quite an amazing little study, actually. It was led by Dieter Tetzner. Um, 
that we were able to is even in 2001, when we believe this eruption occurred, we still have explosive volcanic eruptions occurring on the planet that have otherwise would have been missed by our observations. And it was actually only really through using ice cores to confirm that this eruption had taken place in 2001. And this is to do with the fact that, that Antarctica and particularly these sub-Antarctic islands where these eruptions were occurring are just so remote and they're often covered with cloud. And if they occur during the polar night, as, as this eruption in 2001 did, it's just obscured from our records. On the right, we've got um, some time series of sulfate. And this is something probably perhaps people are more familiar with. And this is the use of volcanic known um, volcanic eruptions or well-dated eruptions and how they can actually be used to um, provide independent dating horizons, reference horizons. And this is really important in um, producing age scales, particularly using as, as in order to, to constrain um, modeled age scales, or in the case of this recent publication from Daniel Magnusson, it was actually used to verify the accuracy of annual layer counted age scales. So these are just two um, examples. So moving on now to the, the marine aerosols. Um, this is really important that, um, you know, the, the examples here showing some of the, the sea ice breakup is that the sea spray aerosols, which can either consist of different things, such as the sea salts themselves, the sodium chloride, but also very much an organic um, component, which make up the, the marine boundary layer. And these are actually transported directly to the ice core um, sites through the really strong, um, strong wind events, which uplift all of this from the surface of the ocean and then transport it. And as we found, they can actually transport um, this sort of organic components quite considerable distances inland. The sea ice itself also acts as a good source of marine aerosol and sea salts and halogen species, which are known to be um, emitted from the, the surface of the sea ice. So one of the things I'm just going to touch on is the use of um, something called MSA, which stands for methane sulfonic acid. And this comes from dimethyl sulfide, which is produced by certain types of phytoplankton. And the DMS cycle is actually very complex. Um, I very, very much oversimplified it for this um, slide here. But it essentially becomes oxidized in the atmosphere and produces methane sulfonic acid, MSA, which is what we routinely measure in ice cores. And what we found is that the increased biogenic activity, um, such as that produced by the algae from around the sea ice edge, um, actually results in an increase of dimethyl sulfide, which then meets, results in an increase in MSA, which is actually deposited at our ice core sites. So therefore, we can go back and use this concentration um, to reconstruct the sea ice. However, it's important to note here that this process, and in fact, all of these different processes, are very much dependent on the transport pathways, so particularly things like the wind strength, wind direction, and the whole sort of larger scale atmospheric circulation, which depend, you know, is, is what's driving whether these species are actually deposited at the ice core sites. But providing we've got a good understanding of the transport mechanisms, um, it means then that we can use MSA from an ice core to go back in time and reconstruct past sea ice extent. So I'm just showing here some work from paper from quite a while ago now, um, but it's actually some examples from ice core sites in the Antarctic Peninsula. And one of the things that we were able to show is we had a range of different ice cores from the north of the peninsula and then comparing it with an ice core from um, the Ellsworth Land coast. We can actually um, demonstrate that there's been this really strong dipole pattern in sea ice across um, between the Bellingshausen Sea off the, just off the side of the Antarctic Peninsula and changes in the Weddell Sea and the, uh, the Ross Sea. And this sort of strong dipole um, pattern is evident during the instrumental period. And what we were able to show with the ice cores is that actually this is part of a much longer, at least 100 year trend. So the record I'm showing, if you can just see, we've got the, the Freenia ice core in blue is capturing changes in the Ross Sea. Um, and on the little map on the side, you can see roughly where the sort of highlighting where the area of correlations is refers to. And then we've got ice cores um, from the Antarctic Peninsula, which are shown in the green, which are capturing this decreasing trend in the Bellingshausen Sea. So this is just one example, or, or just two examples really, of, of, of individual ice core sites. But it's what we can do with these as a, across a continental scale that become um, much more relevant and much more useful. Because what we can do is actually calibrate these records against the satellite observations, so we can use those to actually then estimate the changes in sea ice extent through time and plot these then in, in terms of how these have changed during the 20th century. We 
had a, a bit of a review of all the different records that we have. And at the moment, we're pretty much limited to just the last 100 years in terms of our reconstructions. However, we're hoping that um, more, um, more records will become available, but also longer records may become available. So we can actually extend this reconstruction in the paleo back further. But what this is really interesting is, is demonstrating that um, the trends that we're seeing in the ice core records, or just confirming really, that the trends we're seeing in the ice core records are reflected in what's been happening during the modern era, so from 1979 onwards. So for example, the sea ice in the Ross Sea, we've seen has been advancing since 1900. So this is shown in the plot on the left, which is the reconstructions. And this is shown as a, as a sort of purple, um, because it's being an increase in, in sea ice in the Ross Sea. And this is very much reflected and seen as, as what, what has been occurring during their um, satellite observations since 1979. In fact, this is one of the most significant areas in, of um, change in the observational periods. But also we've got then on the other end of this, we've got this decline in sea ice during the, the recent period, um, which is reflected as part of a, a 100 year trend in the Bellingshausen Sea. And this is shown as the, the green areas on the plot. I just wanted to quickly put this one up because there's been a, a, a little bit of interest recently in, in how um, the actual sea ice around Antarctica during January this year was actually one of the lowest um, sea ice years on record. And it's just important to sort of keep bringing this back really is that, you know, understanding the paleo climate is really interesting and really important, but it, it allows us to put some of these recent, um, I guess, headlines, if you like, about changes in the climate into this much longer um, context. So back to my, my little um, figure here. Um, in addition to all of the other marine aerosols um, that have deposited at the ice core site, um, the ocean also provides other proxies for us. And these, I'm going to talk a bit, little bit about marine diatoms. And these are the um, producers, like the algae themselves, that are being uplifted from the surface microlayer and transported inland. And this brings um, these marine diatoms that we can find actually in the ice. Um, and what we were able to do, or what my colleagues Claire Allen and Dieter Tetzner are able to do, is actually identify and determine which species we've got within the ice core. And then we can look at the uh, total abundance um, in each individual year. And what we've been able to do finding this, and this is just an example here from the Ferenio ice core, which is drilled on the Ellsworth Land coast, just shown in the um, little blue star there, is that actually there's a really strong relationship between the amount of diatoms that we're finding in the ice core and the wind strength, and particularly the wind strength around the west of the, um, the area of the, the circumpolar westerlies. And so what this is um, really showing is that you need these really strong winds to actually uplift the diatoms from their source um, out in, the, in the, um, the Southern Ocean, and then transport them around all the way several thousand kilometers and potentially several thousand kilometers inland as well to these ice core sites. And so working with the diatom specialists, the Dieter and Claire, are actually able to identify these um, diatoms that we're seeing, not just in, in terms of the count, the number that we've got, but actually down to the individual diatom species. And this actually provides a huge amount of information. And I'm aware there's quite a lot of information on this plot. You don't need to take away all of the details. But essentially, the, the base layer of this is showing the Antarctic Peninsula, if you can just make out the outline there. And then we've got the shaded areas, the red and the green shading is representing where the summer and winter sea ice cover would be. And then on top of this, we've got the different species diversity. So the two plots on the, the top um, left are showing the species diversity found in two ice cores from um, very low elevation coastal sites right down um, adjacent to the, to the water. And not surprisingly, what we actually see in these, um, when we look at the different species that are in these diatoms, is that these are very dominated by sea ice species. And in fact, they display that the seasonal cycle here displays a very um, strong seasonality that's related to changes in the sea ice and the, the, the algae phytoplankton blooms that you get. The other um, pie charts that I'm showing you here, the, the, the two on the right, are from further inland. So these are actually relatively high um, altitude sites that are a bit further inland, so away from this sort of sea ice source. And what you can see without needing to know anything about the details of the actual individual species is that there's a much broader um, species diversity. So there's a combination of diatoms coming from um, from sea ice sources, but actually from a huge range of sea ice uh, and uh, of um, sorry ocean conditions, and some from very much towards the mid mid latitudes even. 
And so these, I scored the abundance of, um, of the datons in these particular sites is telling us far more about changes in the atmospheric circulation rather than changes in the local sea ice. So one of the things I kind of wanted to point out is just I've given a few examples of how we're looking at changes in atmospheric circulation, changes in sea ice, and particularly changes in snowfall. And all of these big changes are happening around the fringes of Antarctica. So if we're interested in looking at these changes in sea ice productivity, the best place to actually look is closest to the coast, so closest to the source. And however, there are some sites that are even better than this. Um, and this is these... Um, islands of the sub-Antarctic, which are actually sit within or just on the edge of the, the sea ice zone itself, but they also importantly sit within the, um, the area of the circumpolar westerlies. So if we want to understand these really important changes that are having such a big influence on, on the Antarctic climate and Antarctic mass balance, the best place to go is, is really around the edges and look at some of these islands. And so back in uh, 2017, I was fortunate to take part in the Antarctic Circum uh, navigation expedition, where we were actually able to drill some of the first ice fields from the sub-Antarctic islands, um, and this included the Young Island, which is in the, in the Ross Sea sector, um, Peter First Island, which is in the Bellingshausen Sea, uh, Bouvet Island, which actually sits right out in the, um, in the South Atlantic and is known to be one of the most remote islands in the world. Um, and in addition to this, we had a range of um, different coastal sites around Antarctica, so Mount Cycle on the, on the west coast and also um, near the Mertz Glacier in East Antarctica. And so this was a fantastic opportunity to really test out some of these new proxies that we've been developing. Um, and there's some really um, interesting results that are kind of coming from those or have already been published and will soon be published. And so it's just to kind of give an in indication really that Although um, I'm at Bass, um, it's not just about Antarctic ice cores. So it's very much looking at ice cores from a global perspective. And I just plotted this up for a different exercise, actually demonstrating all the different ice um, that we currently have in our archive at Bass. And this includes obviously quite a lot of Antarctic records, but also a growing number of more temperate records. And so these are the ice cores from the sub-Antarctic region, but also from sites across um, the mid latitudes. And we've been working with projects looking into um, collecting cores in Patagonia. We've recently analysed an ice core from the Russian Caucasus Mountains and a number another of other um, uh, ice cores that are sort of non-traditional, non-polar sites. And then obviously working with, um, with ice cores from Greenland as well. And then I just wanted to kind of um, getting towards the end of my presentation here, just finish up with the, um, you know, where next. Um, and the next um, interesting project that we're going to embark on or has already actually started is to drill a new ice core from coastal Antarctica, so from coastal Johnny Maudland. And the plan is, so this is called Shiwa, um, and this stands for sea ice and westerly winds during the Holocene um, in coastal Antarctica. And this is part of a trinational um, collaboration between India, the UK and Norway. Um, we had our first geophysics uh, season just finished um, where we actually surveyed two coastal domes um, and the geophysics is looking really, really promising that we're going to obtain a really nice 500 meter record, which is going to capture, we hope, at least the full Holocene, potentially a little bit, bit beyond. Um, and this is part of a, a NERC funded project, um, but also heavily funded by India. Um, and so the aim really of this um, next project is trying to bring together a lot of the, the new proxies that we've been developing for sea ice and winds, and obviously bringing in some of the more traditional things, the climate and, and the um, snow accumulation records. But what we're really interested in doing is trying to understand this um, connection between the changes in the westerly winds and changes in sea ice and how they may influence or change the concentration of CO2, which we can then also measure in the ice core. And this is because um, the Southern Ocean acts as this um, at the moment, it's acting as a, a fantastic sink for um, anthropogenic CO2. So at the moment it's, it's about, draws down about 40% of the atmospheric CO2 and around 70% of the atmospheric um, heat into the Southern Ocean. 
However, changes in the wind strength and changes in the amount of sea ice cover will influence this air-sea exchange. And there is some potential and there's some evidence that actually we can have a switch between the Southern Ocean being a sink for, for CO2 and to actually potentially becoming a source for CO2. And that means that when we have these stronger winds or less sea ice, um, we can then start to draw up the, um, the CO2 from the deep ocean and start to re-emit it to the atmosphere. And obviously that's something that we'd really like to, you know, it's a very important process, particularly with our future projections that we really need to understand in, in a bit more detail. So we're hoping that um, this new ice core that we're going to collect, we're going to produce a high resolution CO2 record together with all these new proxies for sea ice and, and winds and start to try and um, understand actually what's driving these processes or, or, or how sensitive is the relationship between the two. And so with that, I'm just going to finish um, and really just to sort of um, hope that I've given you, it was intended as a, a little taster um, of some of the different things that we can do within ice cores and hopefully um, provide maybe a little bit of inspiration for potential collaborations or ideas that other people may have um, to, to come and sort of talk to me um, and see if we can um, do some more research with ice cores. Um, and with that, I will finish. And thank you very much.